morning, everyone. Welcome to today's uh, talk on hospital process for COVID-19 patient admission and uh, how to be attended to. We know these are unprecedented times and there's a lot of information on this new ailment, COVID-19. And from the brief background of what we've been uh, getting from the presentation and various news that is presented. It is a serious respiratory viral infection caused by a novel coronavirus recently named SARS-CoV-2. And this was discovered in uh, Wuhan, China in December 2019. It's very important to understand when one needs to get medical care. We are always, having normal flus, colds, but COVID has presented itself with uh, uh, more serious uh, symptoms. And it's important to not sit back and uh, look at how you're feeling sick and not getting attended to. There should be no alarm. The medical uh, uh, facilities are well aware on how to handle it. But at home or when you're, wherever you're doing your normal duties, it's good to be alert of anything that looks alarming. And from the symptoms, if it's a severe headache and sore throat, sometimes it could be a fever that is not going down, constant cough. But shortness of breath is one of the areas that most people know that there is uh, needed further attention. When you present these ailments, it's good to go to seek uh, treatment at an outpatient facility. And uh, based on what the doctor will carry out on your history, he, will, he or she will carry out triage. And based on uh, you know, further treatment, he may require to do labs. And that could include blood workout and uh, the COVID test. And they only do it when they see that you may require it. Uh, of course, in the hospital or hospitality industry, members are required to do the test in order to go back to work. Once you uh, done the test, it could happen at various places. It could be at a outpatient facility that has both the lab and the doctor facility in place, or you may be sent to the accredited facilities which the government has listed out should carry out the test. Once you're at the facility, there's a process they'll take you through. Uh, normally the tests will be done and then they will uh, alert you once the results are out. Thereafter, if the results turn out positive, that is when they alert the Ministry of Health. And if you are at home or wherever you are, you are supposed to get the advice of the doctor who was, uh, who was uh, consulting and they will you know provide you with further treatment it could be home isolation or it could be that if your your ailments are presented which are worse than uh, what would be normal especially in cases of difficulty in uh, breathing you may be recommended to go to a facility for admission in such cases there are options of either you are taken by ambulance and it's not just an ambulance they are accredited for uh, you know, what you call EMS, emergency medical services, the ambulances which are designated and allowed to go to the hospitals that are, you know, treating the COVID uh, positive uh, patients. So based on that, the, first, the, the ambulance will be called and depending on whether you have the coverage or not, they will facilitate that. But at hospital, the, the admission process will be carried on. Now, to take us through how, what happens, you know, in that process of being uh, hospitalized or prior to hospitalization, we have um, Dr. Thanis Maunga. She's a well-known doctor, aviation spe specialist, and she will take us through this uh, other session on what, what happens in terms of patient management for all coronavirus uh, patients. Thank you. My name is Dr. Panis Maonga. I'm waiting for my presentation to be loaded. Um, thank you. I'm seeing we are a lot of people. We are 48. And really, my answer is to answer what really happens when you test positive with COVID-19 in Kenya. 
So sometimes people will do the test because the workplace has asked for the test, like us, the healthcare workers, people in hospitality industry. Sometimes the test will be asked because of the symptom that you're presenting for. And sometimes the test may be asked because of your being, your, what is called contact tracing, where you've been in close contact with someone who has turned positive or a family member or a friend or a, another worker. So, so actually what I'm supposed to answer is what really happens when one tests positive for COVID-19. Uh, so the next slide, please just continue with it so that for the rest of the people, that's the picture of coronavirus. Uh, kindly stay a bit. Uh, the words that we're all hearing, quarantine, isolation, and symptomatic. Now, quarantine is where we separate and restrict movement of people who are well. And they are, we presume they're exposed, but they don't have an illness. So we let them either stay at home or we let them stay in a place, either a hospital or a facility. Now, isolation is where we separate and restrict movement of ill persons with contagious disease. So they can either isolate at home or in hospital. Now, asymptomatic means you don't have any symptoms. So you have an illness, yes, you've been done a test, we've confirmed you have it, but you don't have symptoms. So if it's for COVID-19, you don't have any flu-like symptoms, you don't have headaches, you have nothing at all. Now, the other thing we need to know the next slide is who is a contact. A contact is a person, a close contact. Is any individual who is within six feet of an infected person for at least 15 minutes. And it should have occurred within two days before that person was either tested or that person had the illness or symptoms. So unless in the office you sit within six feet of a person and that person is, is, is near you and you are with them two days before either they were tested or two days before they got uh, infected with the illness, that's the only time you become a close contact. But if you stay 10 feet away from them on the same floor, but you're not within the two meters, then you are not really a close contact. And then a confirmed case is where we do a lab test. Once we've done the lab test and we find you actually have COVID-19, you're called, whether you have symptoms or not, you're actually called a confirmed case. A suspected case, you have the symptoms, but uh, you have the symptoms and because you have the symptoms, you have the symptoms, but we've not tested you yet. So you're a suspected case. So when we test you and find you have COVID-19, then you become a confirmed case. A probable case, you meet the case definition and you don't have any other thing we've tested you, you're not, you're not a confirmed case, so you are just there probable. So the thing about once you've done a test, you need to be informed about your result. So you can either be informed your result by a, the doctor who did it, they sent the email to him or an SMS to him or your result to him. You can also be informed by the lab that did it by sending directly the email to you or an SMS to you. You can also be informed by the Ministry of Health doctors. So whoever gets the result first is the person that will call you and will actually inform you about your result. So it can be either, it can be your doctor, it can be health disease surveillance team. And once the person informs you, if they're medical, if they're doctors, now they'll be able to do two things. They'll be able to find out about your symptoms. They'll be able to find out about your home environment and they'll be able to find out if you have a chronic illness. And once they've done that, once they call you and speak to you about those things, then at that point they decide, are you going to go uh, to, are you able to isolate at home? Are you able, to, if your home environment is not right, they will tell you, they will send you to isolate either at a hospital or an isolation facility. If you're very sick and your symptoms are very, your symptoms are more, then they will send you to be in a hospital. So the people who are isolated in a healthcare facility or in hospital, they are people that uh, have a severe illness. Now, people who don't have symptoms in my illness and they don't have a chronic illness, those ones are considered for a uh, home isolation. But for you to be in home isolation, first we should have done the test and confirm you actually have COVID-19 and your result is positive. You have no symptoms or you have mild symptoms and you're stable enough to receive care at home. Then you don't have any underlying medical condition and your home is suitable for home-based isolation. What do I mean? You're able to get a bedroom on your own, a bathroom on your own, a toilet on your own for your use. You're able to get a caregiver to take care of you. 
you're able to have access to food and basic needs, and you also have access to a telephone so that you can speak to the doctor. You can also be able, in case you really, you know, you can get unwell. You didn't have symptoms, and now you start having symptoms and they become severe. So you need to be able to call someone or call 719, which is the government hotline, to now tell us uh, to guide you on which hospital to go and most likely send an ambulance to pick you from home to the hospital. So those are the things we really care about, especially the home environment. Now, the other thing about the home environment, the, who, the people you stay with, there shouldn't be any other person who can get unwell or if they got COVID-19, they can complicate. So if you're living with someone about 65 years old, and they have also maybe diabetes, or you have a very young child uh, between under two, and they have any other illness, we might not allow you to isolate at home. So even if you are home or special enough, you could get a bedroom on your own, a bathroom on your own, but you have any other person who might be risked by you having the COVID-19 there, we might not allow you to isolate at home. Now, the other thing we really need is a caregiver who can take care of you. Someone who can be able to take like your temperature, someone who can be able to, you get a healthcare who is assigned to you to take care of you, either from the insurance side, either from your company or from the ministry of. We need a caregiver who can be able to update uh, this healthcare worker to say how you're doing. So we always need that in, in place so that you're able to allow someone to isolate at home. So, if we had 100 people that are tested positive for COVID-19, mostly 90%, 90 of those people will isolate at home. 10 might not isolate at home. Two might be they are not isolating at home because of their home environment. The home is not suitable for them to isolate at home. The other eight may not isolate at home. They need hospital care or a facility isolation because of they are not stable enough they have severe symptoms, they have an underlying condition, uh, they have no caregiver, they have, we have no way to access them when we have to. Maybe even where they stay, their road networks are not good, there is a place that has no network, so we are not able to do that. Now, so when we say mild symptoms or no symptoms, what do we mean? When we say mild symptoms, we say you're having things like either a fever that is for three days or less than three days, and the fever is not getting above 38 degrees. And if you take a painkiller, the fever subsides. You're having a dry cough, you're having a running nose, a sore throat, a headache, and you're having fatigue, loss of taste or smell. That fall in mild symptoms. So if you have that, we let you stay at home if your home environment is right and the patient conditions are also right. Now, severe symptoms. If you, even if you're at home isolation and you start developing chest pain, pressure at the chest, you're having difficulty in breathing, you're having shortness of breath, loss of speech or movement, tingling pain in hands, diarrhea vomiting will, can make your kidneys shut, or you're having a rash or discoloration of fingers, toes, or mouth, we cannot let you isolate at home. We'll need you now to go to hospital. And what happens, you'll actually call your healthcare provider or each day as your healthcare provider calls you, they normally find out how you're doing. And if they find you have any of these symptoms, then they will organize for you how to get to accredited hospitals that the Ministry of Health has said, these are the hospitals that are treating COVID-19. And the, how you get to hospital, the healthcare provider or the 719 number or the healthcare facility that you've been going to, they will, or the ones who put you on home isolation will get an ambulance and the ambulance will come for you and take you to hospital. Now, when you get to hospital, depending on how your symptoms are, uh, if you're just having difficulty in breathing, you're not really sick, they will give you oxygen. If you're having diarrhea, you're vomiting, you'll be given some fluids. If then they will do other blood tests, they will do chest x-rays, they will check for any other thing because we cannot just assume the symptoms you're having is just COVID-19. It might be something else. It might be pneumonia, it might be a bacterial infection, it might be TB, it might be any other thing. For the diarrhea, it might be something happening in gastrointestinal system. So we have to check and do all the tests and find out what else it could be. So we run other tests and depending on what we find, then that is when we'll treat you. Currently in the world, there's no definitive treatment for COVID-19. But depending on how the patient is, do they have an underlying condition? How are the tests? 
how is the patient looking, the status, what is locally available, what is the doctors who are taking care of him comfortable to give. They might give different things. They might give antivirals, they might give a few anti, uh, antibiotics. So it depends totally on the status of the patient, what is locally available, what the tests have done. Now, some patients get really sick and they cannot breathe on their own. Now, those ones need intensive care management. Where they are assisted to breathe, they can be assisted to eat, and they're actually taken care of. And if you have any other underlying medical condition, when you're in hospital and for treatment, they will still treat the underlying medical condition. So the treatment was in, there are two people who can cover, most of the time, when you're admitted in hospital with COVID-19, government takes up your treatment and what they're not able to cover or the hospital that you went, sometimes you find you might have to chip in. But uh, by the time you are in home isolation, the government is aware. So the time you were done a test, and the test you were done, the lab, each positive result, the lab that does a test has to inform a minist the Ministry of Health. So there's a data sheet that the Ministry of Health gets every day with all patients that have COVID, who've tested positive for COVID-19. And then the Ministry of Health normally knows which doctor is taking care of which patients. So you as the doctor taking care of which patients, you actually inform them, these are my patients. So we have county coordinators that you inform and tell, like for the Nairobi region. You call and tell, these are my patients, these are the patients I'm taking care of from this organization. Uh, these ones are able to isolate at home, you give out their names. These ones are not able to isolate at home. Then you come up with a, together with the Ministry of Health and the county person, you come up with where isolation. And then now they pick it up from there. Now, when they go for isolation and treatment, the government is aware. If the person is not able to meet their treatment, then the government comes in. Now, once you've been in home isolation, you can actually end it. Nowadays, they've changed the guideline. You don't have to isolate for 14 days. But some people will need to isolate for 14 days. And some people will end it in 10 days. Now, when you're isolating, your family members and the people who are close to you, who are called close contacts, or people who are suspected cases, those ones will be in quarantine. Now, in isolation, you totally stay like, a, people call it like a prison, where you stay in a room, you have brought your food outside, uh, people are keeping distance from you. If you have to be near anyone, you should have a mask on. So even you limit visitors and all that, you don't share any personal items, you don't share any other thing, you can't share, you even get a spoon, a cup, and a plate for your use for during that time. So you don't change your cup, plate, and, and, and even spoon. You use the same ones which are taken by your caregiver who has gloves on. They wash them and those are the cups you use throughout the, the period. We are discouraging disposable uh, utensils because you will put them into the dustbin. Kenyans are very, some people are not nice. They will pick them and either use them or pick them and sell to other people. So we want things that can be used again and again so that they can be washed. And once maybe that is over, then you wash and sanitize well and use them again. So the other thing that, so the, your close contacts, who might be your workmates or family members, they will quarantine. What does quarantine mean? They'll be restricted from movement and they'll also work from home. And if it's, uh, people go to work, they'll have also to stay at home. And they stay at home, the people who are quarantined stay at home for 14 days. And when they stay at home for 14 days, they're, all, they're only supposed to leave if they have to go to the supermarket or if they have to go to hospital. Now, for close contacts, we, we normally don't do, if it's really necessary is when we do tests for them. But if they, don't, if they have symptoms, your close contacts, they'll be done a test. That is mandatory. If they have symptoms, they'll be done a test. But if they don't have symptoms, it's not mandatory for them to do a COVID-19 test. But if they have symptoms within these 14 days, they will be done a test. If they are done a test and they turn positive, so they stop quarantine, they enter into isolation. And now they start doing the things that are put on the screen. Where they limit visitors, you take your temperature morning and evening, then when your healthcare provider calls you say, you practice regular hand wash, you maintain physical distance with your family members, you do not share personal equipment uh, items. And then the other thing, you have to sleep in a separate well-ventilated bedroom. If it's not possible, then you sleep in separate beds. Now, the other thing about this bedroom, it should be able to open the window outside. 
So it shouldn't be a bedroom that doesn't have windows or a bedroom with a very small window. So when we are calling you to find out whether you can isolate, sometimes if you are not sure what you are saying, we can actually visit your home or someone called a community health worker can actually visit your home to actually sh be sure what you've said when you are calling you going through the checklist is what is there because some people are scared of going into isolation facility so they will lie to you so sometimes when we feel like it's not sure then a community healthcare worker can come and visit and clarify the home environment now the other thing for someone who is isolating they should regularly clean places that is handled by everyone else and cleaning you just clean first with normal house detergent and then you spray the a bleach or a jig after you finished cleaning same to the bathrooms and the toilets if you are not able to handle the if you're not able to have a bathroom and a, a bathroom and a toilet on your own you can still use with the other family members but there shouldn't be a family member who has an underlying medical condition that if they got COVID-19, they might be very unwell. Sometimes people don't tell us the truth. They're scared of going. And so when you tell them, how many people do you live with? They decide to withhold some information. So they just tell you two, or they say, I live alone. And sometimes we cannot allow people who live alone if they're not stable or they cannot follow instructions to actually home isolate. So we let them go to an isolation facility. Now, because the ministry, ministry has details for people who have COVID-19. So when you can't find your healthcare provider, you've been allowed to call the MOH COVID-19 call center, 719. And once you give them your name and the day you did their test, they'll be able to check their system and they'll actually confirm you're actually one of the patients on home best program. And what they will do, they'll be able to help you. If you need a facilitation for either testing for your family members or you need facilitation to go to hospital or admission, they'll be able to pick it up. Now, in case there are no ambulances available, because the ambulances are very few, we can actually allow you to use private means. But that is either the Ministry of Health doctor to do that or your private, uh, your destinated healthcare provider not yourself entering your private means and taking yourself to hospital. So we can allow you to use private means and it's not an Uber taxi and it's not your, uh, you just, you can use your family car with one driver who should have a mask and you sit back left. When you get to hospital, once you've been dropped into hospital, that car is not supposed to leave before it has been disinfected or fumigated. So that's why when you're moving from one point to another, the ministry has to be involved. The hospital that you're going to has to know and the doctor that takes care of you has to know so that they also assist at the cost of government for that car to be disinfected. Now, when you have either you've been told to isolate or you've been told to quarantine, it's a stressful period. And some people get so stressed so much that we need them to have counseling. And when you are either in quarantine or you are in isolation, you actually feel like you're a prisoner in your own home. So most of the time you start worrying about it. And when you see the news in the evening and you see how many people have either succumbed to the disease or when you know someone you know and you hear they've gone to hospital and they were at home or you find out uh, someone is complicating, someone has been, was in isolation, now is in the ICU. So you might really get worried. And when you get worried, what you will do is that you have to stay connected with your family and friends, but by phone calls and videos and social media. We are limiting visitors to visit people who are either in quarantine or in isolation. So for you to stay connected, just stay connected through the internet, the social media and technology. When you're worried about something, kindly talk about it. Most of the healthcare institutions and most of the insurances are very good. They've provided helplines that for people that you can talk to. People that you can call, the helplines are normally free. You can call them and you can speak to them. And then the other thing you need to do, you need to feel prepared. Uh, just read information from reliable sources. Feel prepared. And if you are checking news, if you're going to check the news for COVID-19, just limit yourself to a couple checks in a day. If you decide as a family you'll be checking it at night, kindly check it at night. So don't keep on reading about it each time. Uh, don't keep on believing everything you see. Get a website that you will, you will. You can check our Ministry of Health. You can check the CDC website. You can check the World Head Organization website. 
and then get in touch, get good quality sleep, eat well, learn a new skill. Uh, if you're really feeling you can't like focus, you can't do what, you can do yoga, you can do mindful breathing, you can do relaxation techniques, you can join a dance class. There are many things that you and your at home you can actually be able to do. Now, the other thing you need to do when you're quarantining, you can actually continue working at home. The person who is isolating, that person is like on some, some, some sort of sick op. So the person isolating cannot work from home. That person is on a sick op and that person is that. Uh, so that person is, is removed from working from home. That person is supposed to take care of themselves. They're supposed to sleep well, eat right, check on their symptoms, and monitor their symptoms, speak to their doctors and all that. But the person who is quarantining can actually work from home. If their children, they can still learn from home. So that's the difference. The one quarantining can work from home, can leave the home for anything they want to do, but it should be very important and they should have their masks. Now, the other thing about whether you're working from home or you're isolating or you should have a daily, a new daily routine. You should have a routine of how your day goes. You know, I wake up in the morning to pray, to gym, to dance, to do this. I will check on my work, my emails on this time. I will eat on this time. I will do this. I will do this on this time. Now, the other thing, family have to come in and help during quarantine or isolation because the family plays a, a very important role. Now, the family, when someone is isolating, once someone has done COVID-19, the family is brought into this mix. They are a close contact. That, so the family members will, one, have to quarantine for 14 days. If any develop symptoms, then they'll need to be tested. If they don't develop symptoms, then they can end their quarantine and go back to their, to their normal lives. Now, the role of the family, they need to support the one who is unwell. The unwell member should always have a surgical mask on. But the person who the family has dedicated to take care of the sick, this member, because they should be COVID-19 negative, they shouldn't have a chronic illness, they're in good health, and this member should ideally take care of this person for those days they are in isolation. This member should also monitor their symptoms. This member, if they develop any, any symptom, they call the primary doctor or they can call the 719 number for the government so that they are, they are helped on how to do the test. So this dedicated family member, by the time you say you're on home isolation, we normally ask you who is your, who will be your primary caregiver? You normally give us, you tell us uh, my spouse, or you tell us my sister, or you tell us my mother, and we write it down. And we also ask for the number. Sometimes when we are not able to get you, when we call to find out how we are doing, we call your primary, care, uh, your primary caregiver. And that way, when we put them in the system, if they've developed symptoms and they need a test, then we are able to help that. Now, the other thing about family members, they need to make sure there's enough food, there is not enough space for this person. They need to make sure there's a, a, a health balance diet. They need to encourage this person to speak about it. They need to encourage this person to do exercises. The family members are the ones that will do too much. They make sure this person is well taken care of. Their food is on time. Their clothes are clean. This person is okay. They share his worries. There are even the people that we call us. Some people on home isolation. The patient themselves will never tell you when their symptoms change, but the family members will tell you. When they're worried about this person, the family members will always contact you. So we really always tell the family, when we're undergoing this COVID-19, uh, when it comes into a family, it's like the whole family is involved. And as the doctor who takes care of the person, you normally know about the family and all that. So generally, uh, you can, for home isolation now, I'm back to the home isolation, how you can end it. How can you end home isolation? Uh, the, your primary health care provider or the Ministry of Health doctors will tell you how to do it and how do you end it. If you've been in good health, you've not had any symptoms, you've been asymptomatic for 10 days and you don't have any chronic illness, you can actually end the home isolation 10 days after the day you did the test without a repeat test. That, that is number one. For other people, if you had symptoms, mild symptoms, you, might, you will end your home isolation in 14 days, but without a repeat test. 
if you've been unwell, you've been admitted, and your symptoms are either, have either been moderate or severe, and you have a chronic illness or you're expectant, you will end your home isolation in 14 days and you will need a repeat test. Depending on how the repeat test is and how you are, you'll either go back to work or you'll continue isolating or you'll enter quarantine. So the home, how you end, end the home isolation is not clear cut for everyone. So it's normally something that is decided upon by your healthcare provider and yourself and how you've been throughout this period. Yeah. So I will take any questions. So for all of us, we have to stay safe. We have to put on our mask correctly. We have to maintain physical distance, practice regular proper respiratory where you cough into, you can cough into uh, tissues that you can dispose or into your inner elbow and also proper hand hygiene, yeah. So thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Maonga. That has been a very insightful presentation. I'm sure there are many questions in people's minds because this stage, not many of us get to see or hear. And uh, we will have a session now for all members who are interested in having any clarifications done. Thank you. Sean? Uh, it's a cold season and a lot of people are coming down with cold and flus. At what point should we consider a COVID test? The best thing is to visit a hospital or call their even hospitals or healthcare providers that are providing telemedicine services. Just speak to a healthcare provider so that they can be able to tell you whether you need a COVID test or not. For anyone with an underlying medical condition, that person will need a COVID test. So if you have an underlying medical condition, either a heart disease, you are asthmatic, or you have diabetes, or you have any respiratory illness, you have cancer, HIV, AIDS, SLE, where you take medications for every day. You're a person, whether you have a cold and flu, you need a COVID test. And if it's negative, then we'll know this is a cold and flu. Now for all other healthy people, if you've had normally a cold and flu, your symptoms should be improving by the third day. But if you had a fever that is still persisting, you're now getting a headache, you're getting joint aches. But if you have loss of taste or loss of smell while you're having a cold and flu, that is a specific symptom for COVID-19. So you should actually get a COVID-19 test. So if you find, and how do you know you have a lost, uh, loss of like smell? You take a perfume that is very strong and smell it. You can take even the things that are, we use, toilet detergents, the toilet blocks, and actually uh, you try and, and, and smell it. If you can't smell it, then that is a specific uh, symptom for COVID-19. You will need a test. If you can't test, just take something that is um, like very salty and put it at the tongue or very sweet. If you can't test it, then that is a symptom specific for COVID-19 and you'll need a test. Now, the other question is, is it safe for asymptomatic people to stay without masks or other measures? No. Uh, asymptomatic people, all of us, once you're in public and you cannot maintain the two meters or the six feet rule, you actually have to have a mask. Asymptomatic people have to have a mask on uh, because we are not sure whether they actually transmit it or not, studies are being done. So asymptomatic people should actually have their masks on and they should put it correctly, cover their nose and cover their mouth. Yes, and they should continue with all the other measures, washing their hands and maintaining physical distance. Uh, how can you get reinfected? Now, for most people who've recovered from COVID-19, uh, what happens? The immunity, the antibodies that they get, studies have shown, and it has even happened in Kenya, the antibodies only protect you for three months. And after three months, you can get another infection, which might be a new infection or you can get reinfected. When, how do we say, how can you get reinfected? You can get reinfected if, uh, like, okay, this is how someone gets infected with COVID-19. I am speaking, I am laughing, I am talking, or I am singing, and I don't have my mask on, and I'm a spitter, or as I speak, I spit saliva and such, and as I spit, uh, the saliva or the fluids that I'm spitting contain the virus. 
and you're within my one meter and you do not have a mask or then you it lands on you either in the eyes or in the mouth or in the nose that's number one then it enters into your respiratory system so number two is I am speaking, I am singing, I am laughing, uh, and then I spit, or I'm a spitter, and then it falls into a surface. And when it falls in a surface, these uh, droplets, this fluid that have come for me, have this virus. And if they fall into a surface, depending on the surface, there are surfaces like wood, they can stay up to nine hours. Surfaces like steel, they can stay up to nine days. Surfaces like clothes and that, they stay within three hours. And you come and touch with your hands. And then you touch your face. Then you transport it, uh, if you don't have a mask, from your hands to your nose or to your eyes or to your mouth. Then it enters you. Now, how can you get reinfected? Once the antibodies have disappeared, you touch a surface or you are near someone and they have it and you don't have a mask and they also don't have a mask. That's how you get reinfected. So the other one is just to clarify, if one tests positive and isolates, and now symptoms subside, do they require repeat test before they go back to work? No. They, depending, do they have a chronic illness or not? If they don't have a chronic illness, they do not require a repeat test before going to work. So the thing is, there is this underlying chronic illness. If they have it, they need a repeat test. If they are pregnant, they need a repeat test. But if they are healthy and they don't have any chronic illness, they can go back to work without a repeat test. Uh, there's a lot of talk in the market about an antibody test, which can show you if you have had cover. Can you shed some light on this? The antibody test is a blood test. It's a test that shows if you, you Okay, the antibody test checks for antibodies to COVID-19 and they, they, they show either you've either been exposed to it, if you find you have the antibodies, it says two things, either you currently have the infection or you are exposed to it. Now, the thing that we are not sure about the antibody test, we cannot tell you uh, when you got exposed to it and we cannot tell you whether the infection is still ongoing or not. So the antibody test shows you've actually been exposed to it, either you're currently having it or you're exposed to it. So that antibody test in Kenya is not currently being done. Uh, we are still waiting for it to be given the go ahead by the Pharmacy and Poisons Board. There's a quality board also for the lab and something that needs to, to give us the go ahead and the ministry. So there's an antibody test, it's a blood test. But currently I can tell you it's being done for people who are donating blood, for the blood to be given to someone. With the normal test, they check for HIV, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and malaria. They are also doing this antibody test to check for COVID-19 before they transfuse. Yeah, although we are not sure how, uh, whether you are transfused the blood with COVID-19, you can get it, studies are ongoing. So the only place it's being asked, being done, Currently in the country is during transfusion when you're donating blood, yeah. So can one go back to work after testing positive and don't have underlying condition of 14 days? Yes. Actually you can go back to work, the guidelines change. After testing positive, uh, you don't have underlying conditions and you don't have symptoms after 10 days from the last test. It doesn't have to be 14 days nowadays. You can go back after 10 days if you don't have a chronic illness and you don't have symptoms without repeating a test. But there's a but also. Uh, which industry do you work in? Because if you are in the healthcare industry, you need a clearance uh, certificate. If you are in the hospitality industry, you need a clearance certificate before you can resume work. But these other places you can go, and if your workmates are good with it, for you to come back and your organization without you having a clearance certificate, because there's also that challenge and there's that limiting too. But you can actually go back to work 10 days after testing positive without symptoms and without an underlying condition. But the person who gives you that go ahead and tells you now you can go to work is not yourself, it's either the Ministry of Health doctors who've been following you up or your primary healthcare provider, yeah.
so that they also inform the ministry so that but you also, you, you, for that day, you'll form the statistics for the people who've recovered, yeah. The vaccine is being worked on for COVID-19. Uh, countries like the US and the UK have already uh, started trying it out, but generally to be rolled out to the public in January 2021, yeah. So there is a vaccine currently being worked on. Yeah, many of them actually, more than 100 by different companies. But they'll be actually officially rolled out in January 2021. Unless you are meaning another vaccine, that's the COVID-19 vaccine. Another vaccine that people normally need, people with chronic illness and people that normally take care of children, they normally need a flu vaccine each year. And the flu vaccine, we've actually found that it can also help in protection for COVID-19. Yeah. And any other person that normally has any other vaccination should go for their vaccine uh, any other time uh, the way they are normally supposed to. If you have children who are still are undergoing vaccinations, kindly do not postpone them. The hospitals are doing it, so kindly go for your vaccine. Uh, according to the schedule that you have. But the vaccine for COVID-19 is still being worked on. It's still on trials, clinical trials, and it will be rolled out to the public in January 2021. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Maonga. Um, we've got quite a number of uh, participants. Thanks to Tahira and also actually for the question asked and Charles. I'm sure it has been a very enlightening discussion. If uh, we see other questions that we may get, we may, based on this, go for another session. But I feel it has been very insightful and a lot of information shared. I also urge the participants to share the same knowledge with their family and friends. And in case of uh, any clarification or further information you'd like to know on your medical cover or other covers that we have in GA, please feel free to contact us. And finally, have a good weekend and stay safe. And before we go away, the presentation is with Sheila in case you need. You can contact her and she can share it with you.